Hello and welcome to another installment of Let's Play Civilization IV Realism Invictus. This is the Asharid Het, and after watching my previous upload, it's abundantly clear to me that the sound quality was unacceptably terrible. And so I've gone ahead and bought a new microphone, which should alleviate that problem. That shouldn't be an issue going forward. That said, I don't really have any pretense that this is anything more than me just playing a game and talking about it. I don't really take it that seriously, but having an audible voice that's intelligible and not grating is, uh, is a matter of some concern. So, Anyway, in the previous video we overviewed the Greek civilization in general, and we went ahead and just started it, had sketched some some first thoughts on the starting position, but now we're actually going to begin playing for real. So, uh, like I had said, this is an exceptionally good spot. Looks like there is no jungle, no swamp. The game likes to give you either or both of those. Um, we have fresh water, generally good land. Um, Grassland is rarer in Realism Invictus than in the base game, um, so plains are fine. Flatland actually tends to be preferable, um, particularly later on when farm yield becomes very high and you can convert that into output from specialists. But this is just a clean, nice start and it's loaded with food. Not only do we have three cows and two fish, but also this potato. Um, were it not for the potato, well, honestly, the potato doesn't really make a difference with respect to this question, but um, I am absolutely going to go pastoral nomadism early on, and we should be able to crank settlers and workers and irregulars very quickly. Um, so let's get a basic idea where we want to move our warrior. This looks like a coastline up here. Um, I kind of have a feeling the way that these shorelines are narrowing that this might be kind of the dead end of a peninsula. Um, I think I'm going to go northwest here and then we'll go um, we will go counterclockwise. Yes. Okay, that is looking to be more and more true. Seems like I was right. It could be some isthmus that um, in rather Greek fashion extends into another landmass, but it looks like this is just the rounded edge of the continent, most likely. Absolutely going to settle in place. Ah yes, the the uh, um, can't think of the term right now. It's not anglicized. It's not Athens. It's Athenai. I like this. And if another leader conquers this city, who historically had conquered it, it will be renamed to whatever their culture referred to the city as. I think that's cool. Not only the Civ, but the leader. So, for instance, if you play as the Americans and your your uh, the leader you've selected is Washington, then your capital will actually be Philadelphia because that was the original capital um, in Washington's day. And during his presidency, you know, there was no White House, there was no Washington, D.C. yet. Um, but if you play as like FDR, then it's going to be Washington. So I think that's a really cool feature. Something that took a lot of effort and work in the production of the mod and adds quite a bit of immersion, but it's still ultimately just changing text and tying them to certain leaders, but I really like that feature. So, Athenai, um, just as a placeholder, holder, I'll select a warrior for now, but we will, um, I'm gonna take a more careful look at what to research and what to build. I had said before, I think I wanna go agriculture and then AH. That's probably what I'm gonna end up doing. We don't have raging barbs on, so, like I said, hopefully it won't be a tower defense game. Um, and that should give us some freedom to pursue some other things. On Raging Barbs, you basically have 60 turns 
to have an archer up in your city and another unit to guard any improvement that you have built additionally. Since this looks like the end of the coastline here, we may not have too much barb pressure. It'll be easier to spawn bust, potentially. Um, I'm going to go ahead and do avoid unhappiness so the city won't grow until it becomes unhappy. There's no whipping your citizens uh, with slavery like there is in vanilla beyond the sword, so you can't just overgrow intentionally and convert them into hammers. So it's more important to keep an eye on not overgrowing, especially since that is actually a separatism risk. Okay, let me see if there's any other thing I want to do. The Greek archers are... 50, 20... Hill's defense... So they actually have a slightly worse city defense bonus. I might need... Now that's not going to be enough to change my tech path. So, 22 turns to research both of these. We're not lacking for food. I don't think a hunter's cabin is going to be worthwhile. But because we do have so much food, I think mob justice is the way to go. This is actually a rather good building. The minus 50% culture looks so crippling, but if you think about it, you're only going to have this in use in the early game where you have no border pressure with anyone. Um, you'll still get to your big fat cross before, you know, it's not going to delay your ability to work any tile in the BFC um, until you grow to the pop to work that tile. You're, basically, it's not going to impede the functionality of your your start in any way. The only thing is, if you rely on it and your population level is at the happiness brink, as it were, you do need to have rule of fear. So if you switch to traditional custom, it does enable local autonomy, which is an even better happiness uh, booster. Well, it's equivalent initially, and then if you pair it with monarchy, it's even more. But you probably want to have code of laws by the time you switch out of that. So other than bearing that in mind, I think this is a great improvement or uh, building, excuse me, and we, we're going to have so much food here that I want my happy cap to be higher, so we'll start with that, and then actually go worker next. Well, hang on, so 22 turns, let's do the worker first, actually, because he'll be able to... Okay, this is some micromanaging. I'm going to put one turn into mob justice and then worker. That way the worker can start improving these cows instantly. If we go worker first, he'll have one turn of inactivity. So, um, But I like that tech path, so we're going to go with that. That is one thing about Civ 4. It has a great UI, in my opinion, but the way that it cycles actions can... Um, uh, trick you or sort of charade something you were thinking to do you have these little checklists in your mind like you know I put my one turn into mob justice now I need to switch to the worker but then you end your turn and it says hey move this warrior and then you cycle through all these actions and then you end up forgetting so it's important if you're playing seriously to stop every few turns and examine everything and make sure you are correctly following some deliberate course of action because the game will just tell you, hey, click here, what do you want to do here, what do you want to do here, and then you get a shining, pulsing red button to click on to recycle that process, and it doesn't really lend itself to attentively following your own plan, but that's really on the player, not the game. Ooh, sweet, we have horses nearby. Awesome. Only drawback is it looks like there's no fresh water over here. But that's okay. I really like having horses. The mobility bonus, in particular, makes them attractive. I think cavalry is probably some of my favorite early game um, unit category. One of my favorite 
unit categories in the early game. They're comparably strong against most opponents. They have attack bonuses against melee, typically, um, and they can maneuver very well. You don't have to manufacture bronze or something to build them. If you get copper and you want to build axemen, as opposed to spearmen who don't require this, you have to manufacture the bronze as well. and It's a little bit more of an involved process and then there's somewhat of a fallback because even though this occurs later, ironworking unlocks the same category of melee units, so um, in addition to its own better ones, but you know, you can build spearmen with iron directly, axemen with bronze, etc. Horses, it's just you build the pasture, you connect it, you start building them, and you can get a really early strategic unit with it. Um, which has a nice upgrade path, unlike our unfortunate UU. <laughs> so, yeah, this does appear to be the coastline. I'll go there when I circle back. The rule of thumb, I might have explained this in the last video, is to explore about one city settlement distance away from your capital, kind of in a circular fashion because um, that's really what you're trying to do. You need to find where do I want to settle next. And if you just go off in one linear direction that's not efficient or useful, you could have an excellent second city spot right next to you, but it's still shrouded in fog, so revealing that is priority number one. Okay, well, I stand corrected. There's a river. We can get the horses with fresh water. But if you want these pearls, I don't know. We'll see what the surrounding land looks like. I definitely prefer to settle fresh water if ever possible. Health is really restrictive, especially later in the game. As I mentioned in the previous video, happiness is a pretty big early game constraint, but by about late medieval on, health is a pretty serious bottleneck. And having a plus two bonus from fresh water is really quite a big deal. Okay, cows. We weren't lacking for that, but it's weird how the color changes when you cycle the uh, or toggle the grid on and off. That looks a lot more dry than that, but I like the map on its own more. but the resource counters I do want to play with because it's not always easy to see these little 3D models. Okay, let's get on the west bank and then we'll go south, swing around. I really like the geography of this map. This looks nice. Like I was saying about R.I. Planet Generator, those weird jagged coastlines, it always did that. This looks like a plausible fictional world. Mountains here, there, the desert to plains, it seems kind of natural and um, not arbitrary or miscellaneous. Oh, farmers, pray that your summers be wet. And your winter clear. Yeah, some maps come out with like random deserts in clumps and then well, not in clumps, but like a desert tile here, a desert tile there, whatever, and it just doesn't really look natural for the most part. Totestra is my favorite script. Forest grew, that's nice. However, we're probably going to chop it because you need two forests for um, the one health bonus, and I don't believe that rounds up at all. Yeah. Well, from features... Oh, that's the savanna. Having savannas also increases health by 0.5 each, but I'm going to chop these. These aren't good. You can't do lumber mills with them, and obviously this one's going to go because the pasture will replace it. So if I had another forest already, I probably would keep both for the health bonus. But um, in this case, that's not necessary. And it's going to be a delay 
building a road to these horses. That's one thing that 3.6 changed is uh, the construction time for improvements and routes is significantly affected by uh, terrain. So building a road in a forest or on a desert or in tundra, etc., takes a lot longer than if it's just on plains or grassland. So in the early game when your workers have a lot to do, um, a route which takes 30 something turns to build through a forest is a big deal. It's worth considering. Okay, now the question is do I go southwest twice and risk ending the game early by getting warriors spawning from this hut, or do I keep with the path here? I'm feeling risky. Let's actually just do the former. Hopefully this desert tribe here will be amicable to my presence. Yep, okay, they gave me a map. All right, so we see a western coastline here, rivers, corn, this is looking good. And yeah, nice kind of natural topographical barrier here with these hills and mountains. Okay, another thing to bear in mind is these animals have very strong terrain specific combat bonuses. So cheetah, three movement, 150% uh, strength in plains and deserts. So it is only a one strength unit. We're a two strength. We have a defensive bonus on this hill, but I don't really want to throw those dice. Desert has, yeah, a two movement cost, so the cheetah can't get to me. It would be, oh, no, it could actually. Yeah, because if it has any movement left at all, you can move into the next. That's how that rule works. But here it cannot. No, it can. The cheetah's going to fight me. Um... Let's get an additional 5% for fortifying for one turn. We can't escape the cheetah unless we go west. But, nah. We have... We'll have slightly better than average odds here. 30% of two. Yeah, okay. It would help if you swing your club, dude. All right, well, that wasn't great. Let's see if we got our first bad combat roll of the game. No? Okay, it did have an advantage. A 64% chance. I should have run away. Why is it saying my strength was 0 0.97? Something's not right about that. I don't think that's correct. It's a two strength unit with a bonus against fighting animals. I was on a hill. Minus 150, because that's how the terrain modifier is applied. It's a malice for you rather than a bonus for them. And all of these should be summed together as like terms. So minus, minus 105, which, yeah, comes out to 0 0.97. The strength of the cheetah is one. Okay, yeah, because it's a malice for me, the 150, I was multiplying it times one, which was the cheetah's strength. That's another thing. If this was one versus one, of course, the odds would be 50%. But minute differences in combined strength actually are pretty significant. So this 0.03 strength difference between the cheetah and my warrior translated to 14.2% odds above complete coin flip average. Um, yeah, so I'll need to bear that in mind going forward. It's a bit of a um, mistake I probably should have known better on, but oh well. I'm going to lose combats in a game. I'll probably build a scout after the mob justice in that case. I don't really know. I did a brief test video just to make sure the volume sound balancing was okay. I hope you can't, like, hear me swallowing every time and stuff like that. I don't know what the uh, uh, 
um, background noise and things like that, how this new microphone will be picking those things up, but I can make adjustments as necessary. As I said, I've not really taken myself too seriously on this. I'm just playing the game and talking about it and having a good time, and hopefully people who also like this game can uh, contribute to that enjoyment by chiming in and that's really all I'm intending to do here. I'm not pretending to be some kind of self-important YouTube streamer or something. Okay, it's weird in the early game when you're just waiting to build something and your scout or your warrior dies and you don't have anything to do between turns, so it just... they end as soon as they begin. Okay. I don't think I counted that wrong. Why is the war the worker should be done already at the same time? It might have switched which uh, tile it was working. Either way, it doesn't really matter. Okay, I will switch to this after the worker's done for the same reason as the intent earlier that even though my city won't be putting out any yield while I'm in anarchy between civics, the worker can be building things, so it's, it makes more economic sense to switch after he's already built. So, And hopefully I remember to do that. I mean, I will in this case, but when it's later in the game and things are more complex and you have to micromanage 15, 16 things and the, the UI cycling you through these actions, little mental notes to self can get lost in the process. All right. Yeah, I didn't really consider a tech path after this. Let's take a look. So we have horses here. Do I want to wait till horseback riding to start building strategic units, or do I want to go ahead and build chariots? That is the question. This is pretty good land. Um, I'm going to want to grab one of these spots, and I'm surprised I haven't run into anyone else yet. We haven't explored that much of the map, but a decent chunk of it. Normally you run into someone by now. Yeah. This is the only thing. I kind of want these pearls here. And even if there's stuff over here, you can't get them from this spot. Um... These luxury resources are important sources of early game commerce. I think I'm going to value the river more than the pearls, though. Maybe settling on this hill here. We don't really need any new technologies to settle this spot. So what should our tech path look like? I might, I did this as a placeholder, but I might actually end up researching early metalworking because if there's copper that it reveals or gold or whatever, we do have plenty of hills around here. As I just said, the early game commerce from things like gold and silver can be pretty considerable and you have to research the tech to reveal that in the first place. Um, I will probably actually do tool making though because our warrior was killed and I need to keep exploring. This will take 11 turns to complete. Um, really 12 if you count the anarchy when I switch to pastoral nomadism. And then yeah, I'll, I'll build a scout next to keep exploring. And then... We're not gonna run into health issues imminently. I don't need a invest in any health infrastructure yet. Um, I might actually go storytelling and then work on a storytelling circle next so that the city has something to build after the worker and the scout. It's too early to build a settler. We're going to need better units before we do that. I might actually just do this. Let's do... Let's do this. 
get an archer. We absolutely need one. Um, animal barbarians cannot enter your borders. Human barbarians can, and they appear around turn 60. So you always want to make sure you have some kind of defense at no later than that point. So that'll be 20 turns, and then yeah, I'll put an archer up. And then... Yeah, that's that's good. And then I can build a second archer and guard the spot I want to settle. That's sort of by the book, but it, it works. Alright, bears. See, yeah, I'm seeing barbarians. I almost never saw them previously unless I selected raging, but it's very early in the game and I'm already seeing them. So that's somewhat reassuring. I like the challenge and the factor they are in the game. It's a lot of fun. Alright, let's switch to Pastoral Nomadism. Yeah, it does, you, you do build improvements slower, but... You know what? Actually, if we're going to try to optimize this, let's go ahead and build the improvement first, and then switch after the first one is up, because we don't natively get any benefit from having this until the improvement's built, but this is going to make building the improvement take longer, so let's try to be more diligent about timing, or that's not really going to matter, I guess, but taking note of things like that will improve one's play. Okay, so tool making, archery, that'll be 18 turns at this rate. So, nine turns left after mob justice is complete. And then, um, yeah, then we can queue the scout, but we can't queue it yet until we have the requisite technology. Yep, more barbarians. But see, like I was saying, it's kind of cool. In the base game, it's, oh, move to a forested hill every single time because the defensive bonus is universally better. But if you're up against a gray wolf, 150% strength in forested hills that's not necessarily better. If you're up against a cheetah, then yeah, Forested Hill, that's going to help you. Um, and so you have to make more situation-specific strategic choices of where to move your units based upon the terrain you're in, the units you're up against, and things like that, and I find that more fun. Uh, that is an improvement over the base game, in my opinion. not necessarily always safer in a certain environment. Man okay. Is using animal. Nowhere do you find him without tools. Without tools, he is not. I do find it kind of interesting that tool making unlocks the ancient era great works of art, but you can't effectively even produce any of these until drama because, as far as I know, there's no way to get a great artist until you can build theaters, which is, like, <laughs> way later. I mean, I know they have to be unlocked by something, but, well, they might as well have just been default. Um, I don't think there's any way you can get a great artist before drama. Unless an earlier wonder produces great artist points, and I don't think there is one. Stonehenge is priest, pyramids is engineer, um, pagan temples, I don't think any of the unique pagan temples let you build an artist, maybe one of them does, in which case, yeah, but otherwise I think that's kind of funny how removed from one another these two technologies are, based upon what that does. Yeah, we're all upset. Okay. Scout. And then we can swing around here, and maybe maybe there's, like, crab or some other uh, seafood resource on this coastline, which will be worth knowing. But, yeah, we'll spawn and go um, counterclockwise again. All right, Iran. Reza Shah. 
and I don't know where he was. Let me check the military advisor. You can always see where you encountered someone you met. Um, on this screen, you can select their uh, leader portrait and then see what units you are aware of of theirs. Okay, he's. I don't know if this is another landmass or if it's just connected down here farther south, but it doesn't immediately look like we're going to have a lot of border pressure from him. I was kind of expecting somewhere around here. There's undoubtedly someone generally in this area. And I thought that was going to be him. Okay, now let's switch to Pastoral Nomadism since it's going to actually give us an immediate bonus this time. And we'll keep building pastures even slower because now they're going to have to build a portable pasture or something. However, the game abstracts that. I don't know because obviously <laughs> this city ain't going anywhere, but uh, yeah, whatever. You got to use your imagination on some of these things to have fun. Okay, so it's China that's to the northwest. And this guy, I hate this guy. He uh, relentlessly attacks me every single time, even when we have comparable strength. So I don't know if that was peculiar to that one game or not, but I think he is programmed to fight when he's not even at an advantage, so... Okay, da, 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 da. yeah, what is at a peak is certain to decline. That reminds me of the scene in Pumping Iron when Louis's dad was telling Arnold a lion at the top of the hill can only go down, and then Arnold just says, or he could stay there. <laughs> so, that is also an option, cow cow. Oh, sweet! Alright, here we were just talking about the delayed construction and the industrious villagers, they must have been really impressed with how we switched our um, socio-economic system to be pastoral nom nomads. So they... Oh, and it looks like I was wrong. Um, the pasture and the savanna are not mutually exclusive, so we can keep this here for the whole game. Have a nice little nature preserve over here early on. Okay, and yeah, let's check. I'm like 90% sure his war behavior is super high. Yeah, well it just says likely to declare wars. He's not very likely. It must have been something in that game. Maybe I was relatively more weak militarily than I remember. Alright. So yeah, let's do this one because we get the Riverside Commerce. The AI governor which tiles to work is not always the smartest about those choices. And if anyone watching knows how to do this, please tell me. I don't know if you can turn that off. Like if you research into a deficit or something, it will rearrange all of your cities. And I would rather my input stay the same until the city gains a population and then it decides what to do with the new one. But otherwise, I don't really want it to shift around the stuff that I told it to do. Oftentimes, they like to... Um, run spy specialists and things like that, which isn't always useless. And in and in Realism Invictus, spies are actually really useful because espionage output is a direct counterbalance to positive separatism. Um, but in the base game, it's pretty much useless. So, um, well, it's a very inefficient use of that citizen. But, yeah, so if anyone knows how to prevent it from doing that, please tell me. I would appreciate knowing that. Okay, so China and Persia are our neighbors. Persia might not be a neighbor in the strict sense of the term. And the Inca. Tupac. Alright. I know that's probably not how you say that, but everyone knows what I mean. Alright, the Quechua tribes. Veteran players of Vanilla Civ will know that Quechua is a scary word in this phase of the game. Also likely to declare wars. Reza Shah, unlikely. This is one of the most important things to pay attention to about AI leader behavior. If you're sufficiently weak, 
almost anyone will attack you. Even Gandhi would doubt you if you didn't have a military, but um, that likelihood to declare wars is something you should always keep track of. Who your neighbors are, how likely they are to attack. Because whatever the threshold is of relative military strength, the trigger will get pulled at some point, and that is one of the strongest determinants of when that occurs. Alright, this time the timing did work out nicely. Scout was built the same time we can start the archer, which we will do now. Our weak Greek archer that has 40% rather than 50% city defense, but whatever. Um, yeah, let's wheel to the northeast over here, see if there's any nice seafood along the coast. I kind of doubt it, honestly. I don't think we're going to see any resource here, but still want to get this coastline revealed. I really like it when you start kind of in your own corner rather than in the middle. The culture pressure is not really an issue. Um, barb pressure is significantly lower early in the game. It's generally just more defensible and it's also generally more aesthetic in my opinion. Oh! I'm wrong! We got some whales. In fact this is if I had my pick, I probably would have chosen Whale. Plus one straight happiness with optics. Um, and I, this tends to be a, kind of a rare resource, so it's always nice when it shows up. We can pair it with this pig nicely. There's no way to get the clam, the whale, and the pig um, in one city. And it would not make sense to settle away from the river to get the horses and the... Well, I said clam, and the pearls. Um, which is funny because clams are also a separate resource. If I'm not wrong, I think that's true. Yeah, no, they are. So, I guess in Civ World we have clams that don't have pearls, and then pearls that don't produce meat or something. I don't know. But anyway... It wouldn't be worth settling for the pearl and the horses away from the river. I'm just gonna get this on the second border pop and not work the commerce from it. That's fine. Sometimes it's gonna happen that way. Cool. And with our mob justice, our pop cap is going to be five, which is also our health cap. So nice. Mob Justice, I think, is a really nice early game boost. I thought minus 50% culture looks scary, but you are not in a phase of the game where you're sharing your borders with anyone or where you are going to fail to get a border pop in time when you need to work it. So at least 90% of the time or so, maybe if you start with, you know, well, actually, no. I don't think you're ever going to encounter a situation where mob justice prevents you from working a tile when you grow to pop two. But, yeah, I like it. Yeah, and I went with early metalworking for the reason I mentioned earlier. Um, with this level of hills, I expect we're going to see copper somewhere in our revealed area. And I also tend to find that arid hills, um, maybe this is not true, but it seems that the arid hills have a greater propensity to spawn resources. So, I don't know, it seems promising. And if, say, there's copper here, which wouldn't be workable from settling in this spot, it would modify my settlement plan. So I want to get that knowledge sooner rather than later. And um, then I will probably expressly work towards building my second city. This is really nice land. Even just a tiny river you can use to spread irrigation. So like I can farm here, chop this forest, build a farm, blah blah blah. And then we have irrigated farms from just a tiny little river. There's no um, um, actual like limit to the amount of water that can spread. It just has to be connected to fresh water. That's one thing I like about Civ. Even this mod, which endeavors to be more realistic, 
It's in like a happy medium. This game is, of course, highly abstracted, but it approximates real-world concepts in an engaging and fun way without bogging them down into a lot of dense minutia. Sometimes I'm in the mood for dense minutia, something more tailored to historical authenticity. Those tend to be more period-specific, but this is a fun strategy game which really feels like you're playing through history. The concept of farms that have, you know, direct access to fresh water, which can be irrigated through them, produce more food than those that don't, is modeled. But it's not modeling like, okay, you know, there's three tiles of river shoreline here, so the amount of excess food is going to be a mathematical function of how much river shoreline you have and you know that would be okay sure but at that point it ceases to be kind of a fun game which is just representing a concept and then more of an actual simulation um, I like the happy medium that this strikes so and like with the animals I mentioned earlier that wolves are better in forests things like that um, that kind of follows similar lines the that's not, there's no like literal truth to it in the sense that um, it's calculated on existing data or things like this, but it's a fun concept. It lets your imagination fill in the gaps there, but it's modeled in the game. And I think this mod does a much better job than the base game in many of those respects. As good as Vanilla Civ 4 is, it's not as fun when every time there's a forested hill or a hill, you should always prefer that. In this mod, it's like, well, you shouldn't always prefer that. Are you fighting a wolf or are you fighting a cheetah? You know, things like that. But all that aside, it's, it's fun how it... There's so much that's kind of plausibly, loosely approximated without being without even trying to be actually simulative. And I think that's the environment where a lot of the fun of a strategy game like this lives. Okay, and we're gonna kinda go wider here and then scoop around this fog. That villager map helped, but we need to kinda fill in the gaps. Okay, and we're gonna build a second archer. I'm actually gonna put this archer here because that's tentatively where I'm gonna build my second city. Um, like I said, if copper ends up spawning here or here, I might want to share this cow with the copper, and then, and in that case, I might, I might settle something like this for the horses and the pearl. But I, I kind of doubt that will be the case. But we're still in the grace period where mealy barbs, unless someone popped a hut which spawned them, will not generate, and so I'm safe for the next 15, 16 turns. So it makes more sense to send my archer over here, get him fully fortified, so that I can build my next city quickly. My, my two pastures with pastoral nomadism generate uh, a lot of food, and we're actually going to grow to our cap quickly, and then that excess food is just going to be dumped out the window. If you're building a settler, worker, or a regular, the food is a production input. Otherwise, it's just going to be wasted, so um, I want to make the best use of my tile yield. I don't have fishing yet. We're going to need that somewhat soon. We might really not even need to start fishing for a while, because this is 6, 12, that'll be 18, and then when we grow to 5... Each citizen eats three, so we'll have a surplus of three food just with this. Um, which means we'll work one other tile, which shouldn't be a food resource. We don't need to start fishing yet. Um, at least one of these needs to be a farm. In fact, it's going to have to be this one so I can spread irrigation around these hills. You can't farm desert, so um, maybe we can cottage this. But um, I think a mine is going to be the best choice for the excess improvement.
And early metalworking will allow us to do that. So it's not 100% efficient. This is a plains hill. This is a grass hill. Yeah, this is going to have more hammer output. I am going to sleep the worker because he's kind of out of things to do for the next couple turns, and then we'll start building the hill. Well, rather, I'll skip turn with the worker because I have definitely been... Aw, oh, damn it. I've definitely slept a worker to wait for a tech and then forgot, and then he's just sitting there. I'm sure everyone's done that. So skip turns better if it's just a, f a few turns until he can make himself useful again. Yeah, hopefully this guy doesn't die. Come on, I believe in you, Scout. Alright, cool. Let's see what those odds were. It was a cheetah, so fighting in a grass forest probably wasn't its forte. Oh, okay, yeah, no, it had zero chance. And we gained one XP, but it still inflicted damage. I'm, If I'm not mistaken... Oh, right, yeah, we can build olive groves, but... <laughs> no, sorry, I'm not going to do that. Maybe on this desert hill, but this city's not going to lack for food for a long time. Um, but yeah, anyway, if I'm not mistaken... There's a minimum amount of damage that any unit must inflict every combat round. And the whole combat phase of a unit fights a unit until one of them dies is several rounds long. So I don't think it's... Well, no, it is possible to fight and not inflict any damage. I don't know how that works. But yeah, so regardless, anyway, that it had 0% chance of winning, but it still reduced my strength by 20%, so something to bear in mind for future combat calculations. Oh, okay. More barbarians? This is an archer. Oh, surely it won't die from a cheetah. Okay, yeah. It's just a three strength unit against a one strength basically should always win. But yeah, no, I'm pleased with the amount of barbs I'm seeing without Raging Selected. I, uh, in the past, as I'd mentioned before, basically never encountered more than three or four barbarians in the whole game, and that basically removes them from being any kind of significant threat or factor. All that glitters. Okay, now we can build a mine with our worker, and let's see if we revealed any strategic copper. No, we did reveal gold, and it was in the area we had already explored, or maybe this was part of the villager map, I'm not sure. But that's nothing I'm going to go out of my way for. It's one, two, three, four, five, it's like six tiles away, it's, nah. Yeah. That's nothing to change, this is my second city spot. Over. Oh, right, protective. I was like, why does my archer have garrison and um, uh, for, uh, drill? Yeah, drill one, and, and then I forgot. Yep, we're Themistocles. We have the protective trait. So our archers are going to be great. That relative minus 10 city defense actually is a drop in the bucket compared to being protective. So one archer for each is more than sufficient to defend the initial city spot. Um... I'm going to go for an early bronze working, so we can switch to Autocracy 1, which is, in my last Let's Play, I made a dumb mistake where I remained in Tribal Union when I could have switched to Autocracy, and I didn't realize that, you know, oh, nasty, plus one on happiness in all cities, you know, but then when I saw Autocracy, I thought, ooh, plus one in all cities without really connecting the dots, that that's no relative change, whereas this removes the malice of additional city maintenance, reduces it furthermore, and then gives you unit production bonus, minus separatism bonus, and happiness from walls and barracks. So you should basically, outside of any timing constraints on when you want to have anarchy, you should always switch to this ASAP. Um, but Furthermore, we have so much food in our capital that um, we can build irregulars 
and have them as a useful input. We need bronze working for that. In fact, I didn't really look at this, the distinctive unit, the Greek replacement for the warband. You know, 4-1, 3% scaling cost. This gets a bonus against archers? That's honestly pretty good. Archers have very few counters in the whole game, so any kind of unique or distinctive unit that has a bonus against archers is... I would say that's a relatively greater value than most of the others out there because archers are so ideally suited for city defense that when you have a unit that specifically targets them it's like twice as effective for offensive purposes than some other random bonus. A recon, eh. Well, actually no, this is pretty good and it's not strictly offensive. This is on the defense too. This is a melee unit and skirmishers are honestly pretty overpowered. Um, they're very strong against melee, so this this will go a long way. So the Greeks have a pretty good warband, I would say. But yeah, I think it would make the most sense to go for an early bronze working. So we'll do don't really need woodworking. We don't really have any forest right now. Um, we're about to settle a spot with horses. We can start building chariots. So we'll do wheel pottery, woodworking, and bronze working. And then once we grow to our happy cap, we can just start pumping irregulars instead of throwing excess food out the window. The most powerful civilizations in the world, and we are not making the list. Just you wait. Okay, so I think this is Korea. Gojong, yeah. Uh, yeah, that should be Korea. I'm not familiar with this historical character, though. Alrighty. Just for now, we'll say that, but I want to check. I'm like 95% sure that was the Korean leader. Yes, okay. He is very unlikely to declare wars. I have had it happen where a very unlikely doubted me when we were relatively comparable in strength, so <laughs> I don't really know how much you can trust that, but there is a palpable difference between the warmongers and the non-warmongers, all else aside. Wow, that's quite the description. Gojong, the Emperor Gwangmu, was the 26th king of the Korean Joseon dynasty and the first emperor of the Korean Empire. Wikipedia. I kind of have a feeling that the Wikipedia article was longer, and whoever put this in here just deliberately truncated it to one sentence. Okay. We're going to fortify. We're going to go southwest, and of course, we're going to be adjacent to a barb. But this is a cheetah. He'll probably have 0% odds again, and then we can promote from the experience we gain. Yeah, and I'll build a third archer, because it's the best military unit we have, especially as protective. And if a barb tries to attack um, one of these pastures, we can fight offensively without forfeiting our border defense. Or our, excuse me, our city defense itself. But after this, I think I'm actually going to go ahead and go straight for the Settler. Yeah. Oh, he didn't fight, he ran. The cheetah knows when it's going to die and avoids the fight. Oh, wait, no, let's see. Okay. It did it once, we can say that. I expect this scout's going to get killed by something eventually. There's a lot of forest in the early game, and you get a double movement bonus with Woodsman 2, so we're going to take Woodsman 1. Ah, jungle. You do exist, but you are relegated to the west corner of the map. Well, of the continent at any rate. It's always nice when you don't see a lot of jungle in your immediate surroundings. That's just simply no fun. You have to get water pump before you can chop it and... It, it just generally sucks overall. There's no benefit to having it. 
technically you can build forest preserves on it for an additional happiness, but that's unless you're role playing. There's no game in game strategic reason to do that. And there's a swamp, so I guess Cow Cow got unlucky here. Looks like we got the better starting area from the looks of it. Okay, and we'll keep this guy in reserve. Since all of these pastures are adjacent to my city, um, we can just offensively fight with him. It's nice too, normally there's at least a forest next to your city. This is uh, savanna, which has a 10% defense bonus, but when you have like an actual forest or prime timber and a forest, which means you don't want to chop that forest, um, adjacent to your city, it's easy for an enemy army to camp there and fight. You know, because it's a 50% defensive bonus, and... <laughs> the back... They gave me Russian background music for the Greeks. Interesting. Um, but anyway, yeah, so it's nice that we don't have any proper forests adjacent to us. Put your shoulder to the wheel. Okay, now once we get those horses hooked up, we can... Um, build chariots. I'm probably going to wait until proper horsemen because like I mentioned earlier we're protective so our archers are super good we don't need an uber early strategic unit yeah and actually I should have gone to this forest to reveal that tile because once he gets another border pop if we don't have open borders I can't reveal any more land inside of his borders, and once you see the tile the city's on, you will actually be aware of its population in spite of any um, intel deficit you have. Dog versus dog, come on. Scout dog, you can do it. Yay! Yeah, wolves do have the, uh, the forest advantage, so that probably was a fairly close fight. Oh no, not even close. Yeah, scouts have a huge bonus against animals, so in the early game they are quite good at revealing land, which I guess matches their job description. But like I was saying, if I had gone to this forest, because this tile is almost, well, no, this looks like it's grassland. Um, if I had revealed the city, then I would know its population for the rest of the game, even if I didn't have fog lift on anything else. So that was a minor mistake I made. Okay, Archer, you, I hope you will win. You're crossing a river onto a forested hill and you were fortified, so that should have been 0%, yeah. Yeah, 3.45 versus 1. We're going to build a city here, so let's just go ahead and give it uh, Garrison 2. And we're actually going to need road building to get the horses hooked up. I'm still going to go bronze working first, though, so I think stone cutting road building is going to be my next text I research. is it going to take to build? Because like I said, the desert hill, it's going to take longer to build the improvement here. I'll either send this worker to start building this past... Yeah, actually, I'm going to go ahead and do that. Um, that's going to take 17 turns. I'm going to send the, the worker over here. I hope... There, oh, there can't be. Yeah, barbs can't spawn two away from a unit. But yeah, we'll get started on getting that city set up. I don't think we're going to have a shortage of workers with the amount of food output we have. And then because you can't build an improvement till you're within cultural borders, I'll just leave the worker here till the settler arrives. We're going to build a second worker, who probably will mine 
mm, this grass hill maybe. No, the desert hill because we don't need any more food and it's the same hammer output. Alright, here's the debut of the first human barbarians. It's not just animals anymore. Beware guys, it's these guys can enter your borders, make your life hard. Skip the turn one more time. Yeah, cities on hills, they, they have a native defense, which is nice. Plus 25 forever. Forests give you defensive bonus, but they tend to get chopped. As much as this whole map is an extensive forest, they get chopped later. Hills cannot get chopped, so the defensive bonus you get from them is permanent and um, in contrast to hills once again if you settle on a forest the forest goes away so <laughs> all right this is going to be city number two is the mysticles i don't know who this is going to be because or which city this will be probably sparta but we'll see nope corinth okay Oh, it's nice how the border kind of neatly contours the riverbed and then the hill there. That's that's pretty cool. It's not even a straight line along that hill. It kind of hugs the natural terrain. Civ 4 is just cool. Alright, we already have an archer. Um, I should have probably researched mysticism so that we can get a uh, storyteller circle for the horses. That was a bit of an oversight, but it's not going to hurt anything to go ahead and build a granary, which I will do. And then we'll start on the... Oh, right, okay, we need woodworking to build the pasture in the savanna. We got the other one by event, so that was a skipped requirement. I'm not gonna build a cart path here to start connecting this because uh, that actually doesn't expedite the construction time of the road. Um, so yeah, that was a mistake to send my worker here. And it's riverside, so once we uh, research fishing, the river is a route that'll connect the cow, which we already have, would already have, via the same delivery method in our capital. So there's really nothing for this worker to do over here right now. That was a mistake. I'll send him back. We'll build a mine on this desert hill. Um, yeah, let's see if I can reveal any more land in his capital here. Nope, looks like we can't. And then let's send you back here. And I think that's going to wrap it up for this segment. I'm a little over an hour right now. We took our first steps. We founded our second city rather early, and we are in a position to kind of rapidly expand if we want. This is a good looking spot actually, Riverside. Gold, pretty naturally defensible with these mountains and then a river crossing from any would-be attacker from the north. Um, I don't really know what's down here, but deserts tend to be nice natural barriers where you don't want to expand through unless there's some, you know, El Dorado on the other side. This is clearly a backyard whales won't even be useful until the renaissance but unless I get conquered no one's gonna settle here so I can just fill that in later as far as claiming land goes this spot here and then depending on if there are any resources in these spots now that kinda sucks cuz this pig we forfeit if we settle coastal but I think settling coastal especially since we are a seafarer and we have an additional uh, trade route for coastal cities is going to take the cake. So something like that tentatively, as far as claiming land goes. Um, well, then you also have the conundrum of this is fresh water, but they can't be only one tile away. Anyway, I'm not going to just jump into settling into a jungle like 
way away from my capital. These two spots look pretty solid. Um, and we're not going to have a shortage of food to pump the settlers and pump our irregulars to have decent early game military strength. Um, but yeah, I think that's going to wrap it up for now. Uh, we will take... Uh, we'll, we'll get a more comprehensive action plan going forward later. But... Um, yeah, we got our second city up, we took our first steps, we met our neighbors. It uh, looks like we have a, with the exception of Gojong here, kind of a warmonger group. But I don't know if the Persians, well, <laughs> we met them here, but now it's the Koreans. Which kind of lends itself to that being true. We don't know if this is connected down here, it probably is. But in any case, we got pretty lucky with the natural geography. The, we have a nice desert to our south. That's a pretty significant movement barrier. From the south, we have good mountains and hills from the west. And um, If I don't try to claim this western coast even, we just stay to these three cities, it's pretty naturally defensible. Um, we'll have to see if we have iron on any of these hills. If we don't and there's iron elsewhere, it probably warrants conquering in that general direction, but yeah, this is a nice looking map aesthetically, but it's also strategically advantageous for us. This is a good map. We have a nice spot here. We're not likely to get much barb pressure, and like I just said, these borders are pretty defensible. So, all right, we will move forward in the next segment. Thank you for watching. This is the Ashard Head signing off.